Welcome to this journey into multi-cluster networking in Google Kubernetes Engine, also known as GKE. GKE is Google's managed platform for running Kubernetes, a system that helps manage containerized applications. We'll explore both the basic concepts and show you how to set everything up step by step. Let's start by understanding what we want to achieve. Our goal is to create multiple clusters that can work together seamlessly across different geographical regions. Think of it this way. We want to set up one cluster in the central United States, or U.S. Central 1, and another cluster in the eastern United States, or U.S. East 1. These clusters will serve the workload through a single load balancer, which is a tool that distributes incoming network traffic across multiple servers. This setup gives us two major advantages. First, if one entire region or cluster stops working, our application can continue running without interruption. Second, we can connect services between clusters, meaning a service running in the central U.S. cluster can communicate with the service in the eastern U.S. cluster and the other way around. This is what we call multi-cluster networking, and it gives us powerful ways to make our applications more reliable and flexible. To begin, we'll create two GKE clusters. Start by going to the GKE page in the Google Cloud Console, navigate to the Clusters section, and click the Create Cluster button. We'll use standard GKE clusters, placing one in US Central 1 and another in US East 1. For the cluster names, we can keep things simple and use the default names. Since we want to manage these clusters together as a group called a fleet, we need to enable GKE Enterprise. While this does add some cost based on CPU usage per hour, it's not a traditional license fee that you pay up front. Instead, you pay as you use it, and it gives you better tools for managing multiple clusters together. To keep our costs reasonable while testing, we'll make a few adjustments to the settings. Since we're using a regional cluster, we'll reduce the number of nodes to one per zone. We could also choose a smaller node size, changing it from E2 medium to a more economical option. The rest of the default settings will work fine for our purposes, and we can always change them later if needed. Remember to repeat these same steps when creating the second cluster, but choose US East 1 as the location. To test our multi-cluster setup, we'll deploy a simple example application using code from the GKE Networking Recipes repository. This application is straightforward. It responds to web requests on port 8080 and will help us demonstrate how traffic flows between clusters. We'll use kubectl, the Kubernetes command line tool, to deploy this action. First, we need to get the authentication credentials for both clusters. 
When deploying the application files, make sure to use the raw file link from the repository. After we successfully deploy to the first cluster, we'll repeat the same process for the second cluster. To verify the application is working, we can use port forwarding to view it. When we access the application, it responds with JSON data that shows which cluster we're connecting to, along with details like the pod name and project ID. Now comes the more interesting part, configuring the multi-cluster networking. The first step is to register our clusters in the fleet, which allows them to work together. We need to enable several important Google Cloud APIs for this to work. Traffic Director, Multi-Cluster Service Directory, Multi-Cluster Ingress Service, and Gateway API. While these services are being enabled, we need to configure workload identity on both clusters. Workload identity is a security feature that creates a secure connection between Kubernetes authentication and Google Cloud authentication. This is an important step that needs to be completed on both clusters. After the workload identity update is finished, we use the gcloud command line tool to enable multi-cluster services in the fleet. The documentation explains that we need to grant specific permissions to the multi-cluster service controller through workload identity. This involves giving a network viewer role to the fleet service account, which we'll do as recommended. For the gateway configuration, we'll follow a similar process, but need to specify our config cluster. The config cluster is where we'll deploy our multi-cluster resources, and it can either be a separate cluster or one that's already running other services. In our case, we'll use our US central cluster as the config cluster, indicating this choice with the appropriate command flag. Next, we need to set up additional permissions so these services can function correctly. We'll do this by running specific IAM or Identity and Access Management commands using gcloud. After getting credentials for the first cluster, we'll check if the gateway classes are properly installed. If you don't see them right away, wait a few minutes. If they still don't appear, you'll need to verify that the Gateway API is enabled in the networking section of both clusters' settings. When you see the MC or multi-cluster options in your gateway classes, you'll know you're ready to proceed with the next steps. These options are essential for multi-cluster networking to function properly. 
To make our services work across clusters, we need to set up two types of resources. The first is a standard Kubernetes service that we'll call store and is a basic networking resource. The second is a special GKE networking resource called a service export. The key to making service exports work is ensuring their names and namespaces match the original service. When they do, GKE will automatically share that service across the entire fleet. When you create service exports in multiple clusters, they work together to act like a single service. Think of it like having identical restaurants in different cities. Customers can visit any location and get the same service. We'll install these resources in both clusters using the kubectl apply command, making sure that they match our earlier deployment that uses the app store selector. After installation, something interesting happens. The service exports automatically create what's called a service import. This service import provides an endpoint that makes the multi-cluster service appear as a native service in our cluster, which we can then use with gateway HTTP routes. The presence of the service import confirms that our multi-cluster networking is properly configured. To test our setup, we'll create a test pod in the store namespace using a simple curl image. We're not doing anything fancy with this container. We just need it running so we can use it to make HTTP requests. When we first test the connection, we discover it's timing out. This leads us to check our multi-cluster services in the console, where we find we have two multi-cluster services, but only one actual service running, a sign that we missed an installation step in our second cluster. After creating the missing service in the second cluster, we wait a few minutes for everything to synchronize. When we try our curl command again, we get successful responses. What's particularly interesting is that when we run the request multiple times, we see responses from both cluster one and cluster two. This confirms that our service exports are successfully enabling cross-cluster communication. The final major step is setting up load balancing at the top level. 
We'll do this using a gateway and HTTP route specification. It's crucial to remember that multi-cluster gateway systems can only be deployed in our config cluster, in this case, the US Central One cluster, where we're storing all our multi-cluster resources. We create our gateway using a Layer 7 multi-cluster load balancer, which will sit in front of our service. Then we create routes that reference this gateway and direct all traffic to our store service. We can monitor the load balancer's provisioning process on the Compute Engine's load balancing page. When we see healthy endpoints in our backend, we know things are working correctly. At this point, we have four pods distributed across four different zones and two regions, a truly distributed system. When we test the setup using the gateway's IP address, we notice something interesting about the routing. It's largely based on geolocation. This means you'll typically get responses from the closest cluster to your location, as it's faster to reach a nearby region than a distant one. To demonstrate the power of our multi-cluster setup, let's simulate what happens when our main cluster experiences problems. Imagine that our primary cluster, which handles most of our user requests, suddenly stops working. We can simulate this scenario by scaling the deployment in that region down to zero pods, effectively taking the cluster offline. When we do this, we can observe the pods in the primary cluster terminating. But here's where the magic of our multi-cluster setup becomes clear. As we refresh our application, we start receiving responses from cluster two instead. Even though the US East One cluster might be physically farther from our location than our original cluster, our application continues to function without interruption. This demonstrates the resilience of our multi-cluster configuration even when an entire region fails, our users can still access our services. This failover capability is particularly valuable in real-world scenarios where maintaining continuous service is crucial. Whether you're dealing with planned maintenance, unexpected outages, or regional disruptions, your application can continue serving users without downtime. All the configuration files we've used, including the architectural diagram that shows how all these components work together, will be available in the video description for your reference. These resources can be valuable when you're setting up your own multi-cluster networking environment. If you'd like to support the channel, consider starting a free trial of our new design tool, which is linked in the description, and let us know what you think. Thank you very much for watching to the end, and please enjoy it responsibly.